Welcome back aliens. My name is Davin Reddy. In the last video, we have talked about secure code, right? And then we understood whenever you make, make an application, don't just focus on the performance. Don't just focus on the stability of the application, but security. The problem is as a developer, we focus more on the application, right? We just want to complete the work and we feel that security is not our concern. Of course, it's important, but not our concern. But then if you want to provide security from start to end, you have to make sure that your code is also secure. Uh, or basically you're writing secure code, okay? Uh, now, if you want to understand how do we write secure code, first you have to understand what are the risks we have to solve. So if you mitigate those risks, of course you are writing a secure code, right? Uh, but how will you get this list? So thanks to OWASP who provides you a list in every few years. Uh, so they do a lot of research, they understand the uh, security risk by looking at the application and they find out top 10 security risks which you can mitigate. Of course, uh, it's not just 10, there are hundreds of security risks, but this is top 10, at least try to solve this first. And to get that, you have just have to go to Google and search for OWASP top 10. And this is the website you will get at the first one and if you go there you will find a top 10 list so this is not the only thing they do there are other things as well you can just explore the entire website but if you want to find what OWASP stands for uh, so it is open web application security project that's good and we have to understand this top 10 security risk now the thing is each risk here you can see we have top 10 each risk here will take another six hours of content. So even injection itself, if I want to talk about that, we, we can talk about it for six hours, right? Uh, but so let's get the overview of all this risk in this video. So the first one is injection. So the thing is, when you make an application, of course you provide external security to the application, but hackers or attackers somehow wants to get hold on the application. How will they do it? So one of the ways they can use injection attacks. Now what are injection attacks? So injection has multiple attacks. Basically we have SQL injection, we have LDAP injection uh, and many more. So let's talk about SQL injection here just to understand what it means. So let's say a user want to log into an application. Of course, to log in the application, you need to have something, you need to have a face ID, you need to have a fingerprint or a username password. In most of the web application, we still go for username passwords. And the way you do that is by entering username and password on the backend side. If you're a developer, what you will do? How will you verify if the username and password is actually correct? So of course you have to verify that with the help of database, right? So there will be a database and you will send this data to the database by saying, hey, I want to check if this data is available in the database. If the data is available, of course you can say it is, uh, the user is valid or authenticated. What if the data is not available? For a legit user, of course the data will be there. What about attackers? They don't have their username and password saved, right? But then how you verify with the database? So we have a very special language, right? Uh, so specifically we're talking about RDBMS database here. Uh, so the language which we use is SQL and the query we say is select star from a table where username is this and password is this. But the thing is, uh, if you think in any programming language terms, maybe Java or PHP, because you have to write some programming language for the backend, right? So we normally put a statement and then you use double quote, single quote, because these values are actually coming from the user, right? But what if a user says the username is Naveen or one is equal to one because ultimately the query is verifying, right? A query has to return true. That's it. <laughs> okay. That's how we do programming, right? So even if in the query is, if you say one equal to one, which is true, a user will get the access that is injection. Okay. So it is, you're injecting uh, something in the code. Uh, so it can be a simple query. It can also be a command, right? Which you're injecting in the code. The second one is broken authentication. Now, what does it mean? See, we, as a user, okay. So let's not focus on developers. Let's, uh, let's say as a user, as a user, whenever you make an account on any website, we have this tendency of using the same username and passwords, right? I used to do that, not anymore, but, uh, one username and one password on all the websites. The good thing is you don't have to buy heart multiple username and passwords. The drawback is if one of the application is getting hacked, if a attacker is able to get a hold on your username and password, 
not just one account, you will be losing all your accounts. And most of the user does that, okay? So they have this tendency of using the same username password. That's one of the issues we have. The second one is default passwords. Most of us are still using default passwords. Now you might be thinking, hey, as a developer, how can you make sure that user is not uh, entering the different username password or difficult password? You can actually, you know, if you go to most of the websites now, they force you to use a complex password, right? Another thing you can do here, of course, we will talk about best practices. There should be a separate video on best practice of secure coding. Uh, but just to give you a hint, how can we solve that is by using a complex password. You can recommend user to do that. And second one is you can provide, uh, what if you can change the username for the backend? So even if a user says Navin Reddy as a username, uh, while you are storing that username in the database, you will say Navin Reddy123. So you're making sure that in your database, the username is different. That's something you can do. The second one can also be, what if a user is using a system? Let's say I've logged into Facebook. Now after using Facebook, I just closed the tab and then I just went away. Now some attacker just using the same machine was able to open that tab and was able to access the account. Uh, one of the way you can do that is by the moment you close a tab, it should be logged out. This happens most of the time when you use banking applications, right? So they don't allow you to access the account if you reopen the tab. They will ask you to log in again. That's the second one. In fact, they, for the first one, they, we have a solution which is instead of using statement, so specific to Java, uh, in Java we have statement and prepared statement. So instead of using statement, let's use prepared statement to solve injection issues, specifically SQL injection. The third one is sensitive data exposure. The thing is, on the internet, you know, there are millions of bytes of data is getting transferred every milliseconds, right? Now this data is not just normal data, it, it can be a sensitive data. Your WhatsApp message, you might be feeling your WhatsApp messages end to an encryption. Uh, they're not, okay? So you are basically sending all the sensitive information. It can be credit card details, it can be maybe credit card details. So if you go to a website and if you, let's say on Amazon, if you buy something, we have this tendency of uh, storing the credit card information on Amazon so that next time you just have to enter the CVV code and you're done. You don't have to enter the, all the details. So that means the data is available on the Amazon website, right? If it is not encrypted, an attacker was able to hold that credit card, you're gone, right? And don't worry, you can still block the card there. But then uh, you have to make sure that whatever communication is happening on the server it, between client and server or maybe two different servers, it has to be encrypted because most of the application don't do encryption for other type of data. Yes, they focus more on username and password, but not all the information. Even the personal information is important and you have to secure it. The next one is XML external entities, which in short is called XXE. That's weird, I know. But then what it means is, you know, in the earlier days, now we are using a JSON a lot, but earlier time for the configuration for data transfer, we used to use XML. Now the problem with XML is, it's a good thing actually. The, the good thing was in XML was this, there was a concept of DTD, which is document type uh, definition. In that you can actually mention the entities. Okay, now what is entity? So let's say in one XML, you want to transfer multiple data, uh, user data. Maybe you have five users and then you want to send data about five users. Now, maybe some name and some information might be repeated. So what you can do is you can take it common and you can save in the entities. Good thing, right? But the problem is this entity can also hold external entities, external files, external commands. Now the problem with external command is as an attacker, if attacker is playing with the XML file, because see on the server side, you will be having XML parser, right? XML parser will simply try to open the XML and read all the information. What if a attacker is embedding a file which will have some commands as an external entity, which will be executed by the XML parser on the server side. Basically, you are running a command on the server side. It can be any command. So that one issue. One thing you can do is you can block external entities in the XML. The fourth one is broken access control. Now this is where, so you know, in every website, you have different controls, uh, maybe for users, we have admins, we have auditors, then we have guest users. So what we do is every user will have a different permission. Every user will have a different control on the application. Like admin can do anything. A user can do anything, right? But only with that particular account. So if I have an account on Facebook, I can do anything with my account, but not with others account. But what if you messed up as a developer, you are not able to assign proper access to each account or each role, right? So whenever you learn about security roles, those roles are very important, right? Every time you uh, provide a feature, you should know who will be able to use this feature, who will be able to edit this feature. And also if I say as a user, I can actually 
control the user accounts or get the information about the user account, but that should be only my account, not someone else's account. Example, most of the time we fire the query on the URL, uh, the username and the user ID. What if my ID is 123 and I'm, I'm able to access someone else's ID by saying 1234. So you have to control that. Uh, the next one is security misconfiguration. Now, example, let's say if you have a web server and of course in the web server, you'll be having multiple softwares, right? A web server itself, uh, you'll be having database servers or maybe you are using some external servers as well. Now, the thing is, every time you use some server, they'll be having some default configuration and sometime you forgot to change the configuration. Sometime we misconfigure it and if attacker was able to get the hold on one of the server, they might attack the other server. So maybe they're able to get hold on DB server. They might get a hold on a web server as well. So best thing is whenever you use any, any external web server, try to change the configuration. Uh, the next one is cross site scripting. Okay, so this word is cross site scripting is simply you are sending a script. Okay, so you, you might be saying, hey, that's very normal, right? On the server side, you have some script which a server will send on the client side to run. That makes sense, right? Because whatever you use on the application nowadays, it's happening because of JavaScript on the browser. Because your browser will read the JavaScript, it will show you the content, it will fill the HTML elements with the help of JavaScript, right? See, that makes sense when the server is sending the JavaScript. But what if a attacker is sending a JavaScript into a victim's machine? Example, let's say I want to attack your machine. So what I will do is I will Maybe you are using Facebook. So there's a photo uploaded on a Facebook on your profile and most of your friends are commenting on it. So even I will comment, but I will not be commenting a normal text. What if I comment a script? So next time when you open that photo, you will be saying some comments there, right? In one of the comments, there will be a script which will be done by your browser. Okay, that is a script which I have sent to you through the server, of course, or maybe I can directly send you or through the server, that's my choice. Uh, that is cross-site scripting. The next one is insecure decentralization. See what happens is, so let's talk about JSON here. So JSON is a commonly used format to send data from a client to server, from server to client, or maybe to store it on the machine itself. So let's say you have an object. Now in the real world, when you talk about an object, let's say, uh, let's say about this phone, this is an object, right? Now this object will have some information. So this is a real object, but if you want to store this object in machine, what you will do is you will fetch the properties of it, right? This is a black color phone. Uh, it has a height of, let's say seven inch, it has three cameras, it has a screen on company is Samsung. So let's say all the details you are storing on in a format, right? A JSON format. But then if you actually want to store this in a machine or in a hard drive, you have to use a concept of serialization, which you convert the JSON data into a byte code or a byte format, basically ones and zeros. That is serialization. So let's say now you are sending this file to the server of serial data, which is zeros and ones. On the server side, server will try to convert, the server will try to get the JSON format, which is deserialization. And then with the JSON server can get the phone, of course. So that makes sense, right? But then how it can be insecure? Okay, what if I'm sending you, so let's say I'm a, I'm a malicious attacker and I'm sending a byte string, let's say ones and zeros to the server and server is deserializing it. After doing deserialization, what if a JSON format has a command which will get executed, right? So that is insecure deserialization. Yeah, it sounds like injection, but this is different because here we are doing deserialization on the server. The next one is using components with known vulnerabilities. The thing is, whatever server we are using on the server, it can be a Apache server, it can be database server, it can be any, any other server. Most of it have some issues, some bugs, right? And if you're still using a server with known vulnerabilities, the attackers will know that, hey, you're using this particular server, this particular version, I'm going to attack it. If you're thinking how they will know the version, sometimes, you know, in the application, you will face some errors and then in the error page, if you are not handling it properly, it reveals everything, what server we are using, what version it is. So make sure that you hide all the information. And that also comes under sensitive information, right? And the last one is insufficient logging and auditing. So the problem is most of the servers are getting attacked every second. Google server is getting attacked every second. Facebook server, even my, my website might be getting attacked one attack per day, I'm not sure. But the thing is, how would we know that there's a data breach? How do we know it is because with the help of log files. So in the log files, you have to make sure that you do all the entries. Is there any attacker trying to attack the website? 
Of course, if there's an attack going on, you have to make sure that you check the logs. But if you want to check the logs, you have to make sure that you first provide the logs. So make sure that you provide proper logs and for everything, for attacks, for logins, for incorrect uh, logins, everything. Yeah, so that's about the top 10. How do we solve this issue? So I will try to make a video for the best practices. That should make sense, right? So that's it from this video. I hope you enjoyed. Let me in the comment section and do subscribe for the videos. Bye.